Live from the Business Radio X studio inside Renaissance Bank, the bank that specializes in understanding you. It's time for North Fulton Business Radio. And hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of North Fulton Business Radio. I'm John Ray, and we are still virtual folks. We're not back in our usual home inside Renaissance Bank on Windward Parkway in Alpharetta, but we're looking forward to that day someday soon. But in the meantime, Renaissance stands ready to help you if you are one of those kind of customers who are tired of computer-generated voices and 1-800 numbers with your local bank. My suggestion is, and I know this from firsthand experience, that um, they're a bank big enough to handle your needs, small enough to do it personally. So if you want to check them out and and try that, go to renaissancebank.com, find your local office, some 200 across the south, open and ready to serve you, and give them a call. And uh, the experience will start with you getting a live voice on the other line. Imagine that. So uh, give them a call and check them out. Renaissance Bank, understanding you, member FDIC. And now I want to welcome Jennifer Kuhn. And Jennifer is principal with Michael McKenzie Communications. Jennifer, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. So uh, tell us a little bit about you and uh, your firm. How are you serving folks out there? Absolutely. So I run a small marketing and public relations business in Roswell. We've been doing this for about 18 years. Most of the folks I work with are professional service people like CPAs and attorneys and technology folks like IT support people and those individuals who are doing application development and consulting around it. And the reason we work with them and that they look for our help is they find really they need somebody to think about marketing all the time, not just some of the time. And so we're doing everything from writing their blogs, managing their social media and keeping their website up to date in a predictable plan that matches the strategy that we promise. So when we book guests for our show, we give them the opportunity to give us questions, topics they'd like us to raise. And the first question you have on your sheet is why you don't need a social media strategy. And I've been waiting to ask this question ever since I got your questionnaire. You are so patient, given (laughs) I said to you probably 30 days ago. Um, (laughs) You know, the struggle around social media, and and I I relegate this back to when people first started doing this um, years and years ago, is social media is simply a channel. And so when you're building your marketing strategy, you make decisions about, do I want to be on the radio? Do I want to be on TV? Do I want to be on an an outdoor? Do I want to go word of mouth marketing, event marketing? You know, what's the channel I'm going to use to basically execute against my strategies? Social media is a channel. And so when people come to you and say, I'm going to build a social media strategy for you, they're wrong because they have jumped over the idea of I need a a business strategy and a marketing strategy first. And social is just the way we get it out there. At the end of the day, um, I run into people all the time who say, you know, I'm everywhere. I want to be on every channel. I'm like, you can't afford to be on every channel. It's not realistic. Um, It's not supportable. And it, it doesn't make any sense because ultimately you need to go back to the basics of marketing and think about, okay. Who are we trying to reach? What are we trying to tell them? And how often do we need to be in front of them? And if social is a channel for that, then which one and how do we go about kind of doing that? And so we really work with clients to help them figure out how to use social as a bigger part of their overall marketing strategy. Sometimes that means they're doing a lot. Sometimes it means they're doing a little. And, you know, there are cases where they're not doing any at all because of FINRA or whatever that makes it difficult for them. Well, let's back up then. And talk about strategies for professional services firms and technology firms, you know, in terms of their marketing, what, what kind of, I guess, where do you see firms like this go wrong? Let's start with that. So there's a couple of things that happen that we kind of fend off against. Um, the first one is there's a misnomer among professional service providers that I get on my business on referral. So 90% of the people I run into will tell me, I don't need marketing. I get on my business on referral. And so the question then becomes, what are you doing to work your referrals? And with the exception of about three people that I know, the answer is nothing. Um, They're not accurately and consistently and professionally going in and working people across the continuum. So we like to think about businesses not just as prospects to customers, but as suspects to prospects 
the customers to referral sources. And you've got to have to manage that whole continuum. So when you say, my business comes to me on referral, and I say, great, you know, who'd your best last referral come from? Okay, how did you follow up with that referral? How do you continue to evangelize that referral so that they know to think about and refer to you over and over and over again? Um, I talk to countless folks will say, you know, here are my five best referral sources. I want to meet CPAs and lawyers and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, because that's who I get referrals from. Or they'll say, here's three people very specifically been helpful to me. But, you know, if you think about long tail uh, strategies, there are a hundred more people that can be sending them referrals. And if they're not doing something to consistently have their name out in front of and evangelize those people, remind them why they referred, they're losing that opportunity. So that's the first thing that a lot of professional service providers do wrong. The second thing um, that we see, and this is common in both the professional service and the technology space, uh, so it's not unique to one or the other, is that there's a there's this idea that it's all the same. Um, and and by it's all the same, meaning, you know, every um, every attorney that's whatever their vertical is, PI attorneys or estate planning attorneys, that it's all the same. Well, it's not. Um, you know, even if you just spent a week on the sofa at home watching personal injury attorney commercials, you'd know there's a little bit of different flavor for each of them. Mm -hmm. And it's super important to help those service providers understand what their USP is, because if they can't um, differentiate their unique selling proposition, then they start to blend with the rest of them. Um, also, if they're leading with the same technology that everybody else does, then they start to blend with the rest of them. Um, and so they've got to be able to kind of put their best foot forward and say, look, this is why me. This is why we're more, better, special, different. And those are the type of messaging strategies that we work with clients on to help them define and deliver and be consistent around. So let's talk about why business owners need someone to be thinking about marketing all the time. So I talked to a business owner um, about two weeks ago, an attorney that called me and this attorney had, had reported that they were doing a lot of their thing, a lot of things themselves and they had become really overwhelmed in it. They're like, I don't have time to do all this. So I need somebody to pick up and run with some of these tactics I had already planned. And I had said to them, you know, I'm happy to talk with you about what those ideas are um, uh, that you've already been implementing. But I want to go back first and kind of look at this through the filter of what's the best practice and the strategy behind it. Um, because it's not sufficient just to, to do whatever the tactic was better. We need to kind of revisit the whole tactic, uh, and, and why we're taking that approach. And so she and a lot of other business owners that I talk to get in trouble because they start off doing it themselves. Then they delegate it to somebody in sales who also wears three other hats. Then they may delegate it to somebody in operations or administration for whom it's not their first priority. And then then they delegate it to somebody's mother's, brother's, uncle's, monkey's kid um, because they were cheap and available. Um, and that doesn't work. That's not a long term strategy. Um, best case scenario, that's like, you know, pushing water uphill. It, you know, it may happen occasionally, but most of the time it's not getting done effectively. You can't measure it and you're just kind of wasting money. And what you're talking about that continuum from the business mm -hmm. owner to the mm -hmm. salesperson to the um, knucklehead son-in-law or what, wherever that goes, yep. <laughs> you're talking about outsourcing again, the posting on social media and the tactic in other words, right? I mean that, that they, the problem is they never got the strategy right to begin with. Correct. So oftentimes, um, you know, we'll run into folks who will say, well, my admin also does that. Um, but if you've ever had people who report to you, you know, they're going to do what they like to do first, what they get paid the most for first or second. Um, and then this other stuff they have to do later on. And if this is not what they're hired for, it falls into the third category. So it's not getting done well. Or and here's the other thing that will happen. You'll take a productive salesperson and ask them to also take on marketing and they'll decide they like marketing. And they'll spend all their time doing marketing and then they'll stop doing sales. So it's just not a good um, strategy for most businesses to try to also put that on top of somebody else. And so we like to advocate the idea that this makes sure there's a regular repeatable process with strategy and accountability and metrics behind it. Folks, we're here chatting with Jennifer Kuhn and she's principal with uh, Michael McKenzie Communications uh, Jennifer, let's talk about 
content marketing. One of the things that you say about that is it might be your most important SEO strategy. So I realize I used the word content marketing the other day in a in a business environment with other professionals. And I, I worried when I got done that that term has become too much what we call internal language. Mm. Spend too much time using the words that we understand internally and not enough time with what people understand to consume. So I want to back up for on that for just a second. Okay. About 50% of what we do in my organization is write content. So that is uh, press releases and case studies and white papers and blogs and emails and social media posts and magazine articles and scripts for presentations and, you know, 10 more things that I can't articulate right now. Um, and we've been doing that well for a long time. What's happened is in the last X number of years, um, Google has said content rich pages perform better than all of these spam pages that people used to do a decade ago. And thus there is an uptick in content marketing folks um, who are largely writing web copy and blog content. Um, and the reason those are important as an SEO strategy is that not only Google's looking at them, but there's two things to kind of think about. Um, they're looking at uh, long form content on a on a page and saying there's a promise here. The promise came from the headline. I get to the page. It's delivered on with the content and that performs well. And if Google's going to go back in and re-index your site every 30 days, you need to have a strategy that you're making sure you load that con- load new content every 30 days. The second thing that happens is on the blog side, uh, more than 32 percent of the websites on the internet, internet today are written on a WordPress platform. Every WordPress site has a blog page and the Internet sees blog posts as news and new items, and it gives higher value to news. So once again, that's another important SEO strategy. So if you're building out a content marketing program and you're saying, I want to try to boost the performance of what's going on, we encourage clients to think about and plan for an exercise where they're not only touching or updating current pages monthly, but adding fresh content as well. And the difference between just doing that for the sake of performance and doing that as part of a bigger marketing program is that we'll typically work with them on a, on a new stream campaign for the year. And so those same messages may be going out via uh, email communications or social or public relations as well. So um, write once, use many. And what is it that, I mean, we, we hear a lot about content marketing to, for uh, again, it sounds like more tactics, <laughs> things like keywords and uh, uh, whatnot. Um, what makes an, a, a, an effective content strategy as opposed to just the tactics that come with that? So if we go back to our earlier conversation about really understanding your USP, understanding your customer, understanding how how you're going to reach that customer, who they are, and how you're going to serve them, then you've got to think about that into your content stream. So what's important to them? Uh, what are the messages that they're looking for? And then how do we build and publish that on, on a regular frequency that allows them to be rewarded when they're, when they're looking for content, when they're pulling content, or allows them to be rewarded when we're pushing content to them uh, via email or social? Um, and so an, an example on that might be, Um, everybody wants to talk about digital transformation right now, but you know, what the heck is digital transformation? And so I think to effectively differentiate themselves, IT service companies are going to have to come out and say, this is our digital transformation strategy. And they've got to explain it to customers in a way that it's more than just, Hey, I bought teams. Um, You know, they're going to have to move past that and show here's how we're going to digitally transform your business. And I can't give them all of that content at once and expect them to consume it. Uh, I had a service provider send me an article they wrote last week, and the article had 12 different points in it about how they were going to deliver on some promise. I forget what the promise was. But I looked at it. And I said, this is 12 articles. It's not one article. Mm. You, know, you have to think about the patience that people have to actually uh, engage with your content. And then you've got to think about the, the need to freak, the frequency need to go back to them over and over. And so a better approach for him and the feedback I'm going to give him is let's take these, these 12 points we're making and let's write 12 articles out. And Jennifer, you talk a little bit about, uh, P 
PR Mm -hmm. in that, and you do a lot of great work there. Talk about uh, how PR fits into the strategies that you recommend for professional services providers. So first of all, I want to compliment you on your pickup in the AJC yesterday. I don't know if anybody else actually reads the paper besides me. Well, thank but you. But I saw your fabulous face there in their little roundup about why people should vote. Um, and I call that out because your uh, inclusion in that is an example of what we call um, experts. And so people, business owners, uh, want to be recognized as an expert in their field. And one of the strategies around that is public relations. A lot of small business owners perceive I can't do PR because I need a New York based agency and a $5,000 a month retainer. And our point is PR should be part of your overall marketing strategy, because if you took the time to create that 12 points of content that I just alluded to, um, you might also um, you might also. Um, roll that up into a white paper that we could pitch for a press release when we got done. Mm. So here's what happens on the PR side. If you have something new to announce, a new uh, product, a new service, a new employee, a new location, a new partnership, uh, a new patent, a new trademark, all of those are newsworthy items. Okay. And all of those are things that you want to tell people about. And so we put out press releases telling the media, a media list that we build and customize for each client about those new things going on. Sometimes the media want to write about them. More often than not, we're using it as an opportunity to call attention to the rest of what the service provider does. So if you want to be the best part-time CFO on the planet, you might write an article that said, or write a press release that said, you just won this award from ABC Agency for financial service providers. The award gives you credibility, But I don't care if the magazine writes about the award. I care if they come back and afford you the opportunity to either be included in some kind of roundup, uh, submit some kind of original piece, or interview you as a subject matter expert. And so what happened in the AJC for you yesterday was they reached out to you because they recognized you as a SME of some type uh, in your space, and they asked you for a contribution and a quote. So that's how that works for clients. And again, back to your earlier point, that's a little hard to do on your own. It's hard to build and maintain the relationships that are required to make those things happen. Mm -hmm. Um, It's hard to have the regular cadence in front of audiences that reminds them to talk to you. Um, And it's hard to have the the content, uh, the ideas um, to go out and pitch and publish. We advocate that every client have basically three topics on which they could be invited to speak or write at any given time. So these are your abstracts. And so the same abstract that we might pitch for an article, we might pitch for a public speaking gig. So we work with clients, especially in this in this new normal where all your events are going to be virtual to try and place them for speaking gigs. But those abstracts could also turn into an article for an industry rag. Um, that could be a great placement for them that they could then use to reinforce their subject matter expertise back with those referral sources. So we kind of go back into that loop again. So you mentioned the new normal. And of course, um, I can't do any interview now without talking about what's changed. During, about yeah, I know uh, what's changed during the pandemic. Right. So what's your perspective on that in terms of how marketing and PR strategies have changed during the pandemic? I think marketing and PR have become more important during the pandemic. Before I finish with that thought, though, here's what I will tell you that I try to remind folks. When the market is down, people need to spend money on marketing so people so their uh, prospects don't think they're dead. And when the market is up, you spend market money on marketing because you're doing well and you want to keep doing well. Um, and so that's one of the hardest things in the new normal is talking to some businesses who have said, well, I work in this industry and right now they're not doing anything. So we're going to stop marketing. I'm like, great. Then you're all all going to be perceived as dead on the back end. Mm. Um, Instead of trying to be helpful and talk to them about innovative ways they can engage with you, even if there's some kind of shutdown in their space. Now, beyond that, specifically how it's changed. If people are not going to get out in front of people and press the flesh and, you know, all these people who built their entire business out of networking and going to events, you know, I don't know how many clients we've had over the years who build databases by going to trade shows. 
and all that stuff is going by the wayside, they're going to have to think differently and creatively about what they're doing to stay in front of people. And that's when going back and re revisiting some of these stridal practices around, you know, email marketing, um, around being present digitally and about the way they engage with people virtually is super, super important. And so we're spending a lot of time revisiting content and content strategies for those folks and thinking about what that language looks like and how do we get you know, to the top of the inbox? How do we get inc increase the open rates? How do we improve engagement? Um, and that's why you spend a lot of time, um, a lot of time planning uh, when you distribute things and where you distribute things and how you distribute things, trying to get through the noise and trying to be available. I, I, I know that when everybody went home in the spring, everybody wanted to have a webinar and that was great for a while. And then uh, folks started to push back and said, you know, uncle, I can't go to any more of these. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but there's still a place for that content and, and making it available. And so if if people aren't going to spend 45 minutes in their car in the morning and 45 minutes in the car in the afternoon, then that's another hour and a half they have in their day that they might be available to listen to, read or watch pre-recorded content. And so there's no reason that you wouldn't continue to do exactly the kind of things that we're doing here today because we're making that available to those folks. Sure. Makes perfect sense. Uh, good words here from Jennifer Kuhn. She's the principal with Michael McKenzie Communications. Um, so you mentioned something I know people are struggling with there, and that is breaking through noise. I hear that a lot. Um, what are your recommendations there? So uh, you've got to move past um, the internal language, the, the being about me. Hi, you need to spend money on marketing. It's not gonna, um, it's not gonna open any doors for me. Mm. You know, you've got to talk to people about what their problems are and how you're solving those problems. And so we have long advocated this concept of pro problem resolution copy. Um, you know, when you write um, any content for any deliverable, your first thing you want to do is you want to help your target audience recognize themselves in that deliverable. Um, so if, if I was selling breakfast. Um, and I know that they're all um, meat eaters. You know, my headlines are going to talk about bacon and sausage um, and, and, and the nourish and strength and power it gives them to get through the day or, you know, whatever, whatever that storyline is, mm. because I need to draw those meat eaters in where I may ultimately sell them eggs or toast. I don't know. But um, the, the point is I've got to help people recognize the problems they have in the beginning of the content so that I can get them to show how we can walk them through the solutions and kind of be a guide. Good stuff here for Jennifer. But, uh, before we let you go, you, you had some, you've got some interesting comments to mention about email and improving the most important part of an email message. So, um, email marketing is kind of a funny place to spend time on. We've recently been doing some recruiting and so uh, for content writers. And so I've been having, um, content marketing conversations with a lot of different folks and email marketing is an unappreciated space, although it's still super incredibly important. Um, the most important part of any email message is um, it's going to be the subject line. You know, ultimately, we've got to get people to open the message. So I can write a super powerful message. It can have a great call to action. I might decide to use a jazzy design template to make it pretty. It might have an embedded video or a, an animated um, an animated GIF of, of you know, my client's logo or all kinds of other fun, fun things going on inside. But if I can't get people to open it, none of the rest of that really matters. Um, one of the fun things that, you know, we've seen over the last 24 months or so is um, people wanting to use all the little icons in their subject line. And some of it's done really creatively and some of it's done less creatively. I get kind of a tickle out of it. Uh, you see it mostly on um, retail providers. You know, think about all those Office Max emails that you get. And they always have like dollar signs and smiley faces in it. Um, but, you know, it, it stood out in the inbox and it's apparently working for them and it's generating some conversion. Um, I'm not advocating that you put symbols in your uh, in your subject lines, but I'm advocating you really think about the 65 characters that you get there because the 65 characters are really the most super important thing that's going to happen. And you've got to engage and get them to open. Jennifer, this has been great. Lots of, um, I love the way you talk because, uh, you just like put it out there and make it happen. And you don't, 
you you say what needs to be said and then you, and then you just be quiet. I mean, I love that. Uh, uh, you, you, uh, some people go on and on and you just, uh, give it to us. So thank you for that. No problem. Yeah. But before we let you go, uh, let's get to the most important question, which is how people can get in touch with you. Sure. So, uh, people are welcome to reach out to us via our website. Um, so that website is Michael, M I C H A E L. McKenzie, M-A-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E.com. People are going to ask me who Michael McKenzie is. And they want to call and meet him. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, and pull back the covers and tell you it's named for my children. There is no Michael McKenzie, so don't send him a, an uh, invitation for a golf junket because that still happens. The bank asks me to meet him. He needs to sign off on the paperwork. Um, it's my firm. We've been doing this for about 18 years. They can uh, also email me at jenniferk at michaelmckenzie.com. Jennifer Kuhn from Michael McKenzie Communications, named for her kids. Thanks so much for being with us. All right. Thanks for having me. Yep. Folks, uh, just a quick reminder as we uh, wrap up here that if you've got some headaches that involve administrative tasks, bookkeeping, uh, some other things that you need to get off your plate besides just uh, marketing and PR, uh, well, go give S.E. Escobedo at Office Angels a call. She's at officeangels.us. If you are shy and don't want to call her, but my suggestion is just call her, 770-442-9246. They've been virtual for 20 years, and so they know what uh, a pandemic environment's all about. And she picks an angel that uh, is the best fit for your problem and your job, and they fly in, get the job done on an ongoing or as-needed basis, and fly right back out. Uh, give her a call. She's terrific. And I know that firsthand, uh, folks, as we wrap up here, uh, just another, uh, quick pointer to North Fulton business radio X.com is our website where you can find all our shows, including this one. We've got an archive now going on over 300 shows of North Fulton business radio. So you can find great business leaders like Jennifer, and we would love it. If you would find us on your favorite podcast app using the search term North Fulton Business Radio and give us a great review, and it's not about us, it's really about our guest, and it helps people find the show so they can find uh, the great services of folks like Jennifer. So if you could do that, we would be grateful. We're also on social media, North Fulton BRX, on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So for my guest, Jennifer Kuhn, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on North Fulton Business Radio.